series of Aquinas seminars this term is on the theme of aspects of Aquinas' anthropology. And it's obviously valuable within that series to take notice of his account of our fallenness, his account of original sin. So I want to explore that today under the title Original sin does not mean inheriting a flaw, it means not inheriting grace. And I think I have very slightly overstated my position in choosing that title. <coughs> I should also point out that, as with many subjects, Aquinas' writings resist being reduced to something very neat and simplistic. He always has things which are, if you like, bigger and more complex than we would sometimes like. Because God's grace takes flesh, so to speak, in the great complexity of human nature and society. You have a handout, those of you who are here rather than <coughs> watching on YouTube, you have a handout with lots of quotations more than I shall have time to read during the seminar, but they will provide some bedtime reading, perhaps. We ought to start by taking a brief note of things that influence St. Thomas, namely Scripture and St. Augustine. Those are the two chief influences in this area. So, very briefly, the Old Testament roots of the doctrine of original sin, of course, include the story in Genesis chapters 2 and 3, but also passages like passages in Wisdom, chapters 1 and 2, about how God did not make death, but he came into the world through the devil's envy. <clears throat> And there are also extra-testamental Jewish writings, like the life of Adam and Eve, which represent our fall in Adam, and include the rather amusing idea that Adam and Eve were in the garden for precisely five and a half hours before they fell. <laughs> Not a long time. <laughs> It's also worth noting the Jewish concept of the two impulses in the human being, the Yetzer Hara and the Yetzer Hatov, the impulse towards evil and the impulse towards good. I've given you a few rabbinic texts. This is the device of the evil Yetzer Today it says, do this, tomorrow, do that. Till at last it says, worship an idol, and the man goes and does it. But that evil impulse is not in fact a purely negative thing. It's that whole complex of drives in us that needs to be brought under the control of reason. <clears throat> and so the evil impulse in fact leads us to build houses, take wives, beget children, and engage in business. So the evil impulse, in fact, has a 13 years head start on the good impulse, because the good impulse is, in fact, coming to the age of reason, when, with the help of God's law, you can begin to take rational control of your life. The New Testament shows the influence of the old. So Romans chapter 7, where Paul complains that he doesn't do what he would like to do and vice versa, might be his version of those two impulses. There is that tension in him between the law of his mind and the law of his flesh. <coughs> and the law and our power of reason are not enough to overcome the evil impulse. We need instead 
the grace of Christ, the gift of the Holy Spirit. More importantly for our purposes, you have in the Gospels, but especially in St. Paul, the contrast between Christ, the second Adam, and the first Adam. We die in the first, we are brought to life in Christ. In Romans chapter 5, sin comes into the world through one man, and death through sin. And so death spread to all men. In the Latin that St. Augustine knew, in quo omnes peccaverunt, which in the light of the Greek means, because all men have sinned, Augustine read it to mean in whom, that is, in Adam, all have sinned. And some people would argue that that set the whole doctrine off on the wrong path. But if you continue to read Romans chapter 5, by one man's disobedience, the many were made sinners. So by one man's obedience, the many will be made righteous. Paul does seem to say that all humanity is constituted in a state of sin, and at least potentially all in a state of grace, by the first Adam and the second, respectively. Jumping ahead over quite important developments, we can pick up St. Augustine, who in his Confessions explains from his own experience our need for liberating grace. Thou dost command continence, grant what thou dost command, and command what thou wilt, which annoyed Pelagius and launched a long and bitter controversy and in his attempt to convince Pelagius and his followers that we stand in need of God's healing grace, Augustine adopts a multi-pronged approach, most of the components of which are, so to speak, inherited by St. Thomas. So Augustine says, looking at the woes to which we are subject, something must have gone wrong. We couldn't have been like this in paradise. <coughs> he picks up that possibly misunderstood phrase from St. Paul to mean that we all sinned in Adam. We were all in him. <coughs> We were all in him when he so sinned as to lose all in himself. And he doesn't know how we were in Adam, even in his retractations late in life. He doesn't know where the human soul comes from, whether it derives from the one first created man, or by a separate act of creation giving each individual his or her soul at conception. But he does want to say that we have some kind of collective guilt. The entire mass, therefore, incurs penalty. And if all were condemned, that would be just. He also says repeatedly that because sexual intercourse is flawed by lust, it passes on the bond of sin to the progeny. But there are a couple of texts late in Augustine's writings where he seems to say the opposite. The activity in which married couples engage <coughs> to beget children is not evil, and the fruit of bodies, sexes, and unions is the good of human nature, but human nature itself was damaged in the original parent who sinned. And I do think that there are two 
main component in Augustine's teaching, which have become the main component in Aquinas' teaching. There is that picture of original justice, original rightness, that is text number 12, um, from the On the Merits and Remission of Sins, chapter 36. In the first human beings, the rational soul had not developed a disobedience to its Lord, so as by reciprocity of punishment to bring on itself the rebellion of its own servant, the flesh. There's that picture of a kind of chain of command, whereby the higher powers of the soul obey God, and so the lower powers obey the higher powers, and the soul and the body obeys the soul. That chain of command, whose first link is broken by the first sin, and the whole thing collapses, in that picture is there clearly also in Aquinas. So there's that picture of original harmony between God and man and within man, which gets fractured. And then there is a sense that nature itself is damaged. Man's nature indeed was created at first faultless and without sin, but that nature of man in which everyone is born from Adam now wants a physician because it is not sound. Augustine also develops, especially in his latest writings, a profound sense of our dependence on grace for all good thoughts, and that will be the subject of, well, ideally not one seminar, but a lecture course lasting several years. <laughs> so we won't go into that today. <coughs> One of the phrases inherited from St. Augustine is the idea that original sin is passed on by propagation, not imitation. That phrase sticks. And I think that phrase, by propagation, not imitation, raises questions about what original sin is. Is it a kind of inherited guilt? Is it a kind of transmitted disease factor? We know, and they knew in the past, though they didn't know the genetic mechanism, but it is known that certain diseases can be passed on. Like, for example, sickle cell anemia. You can inherit a flaw. And you might inherit a positive disease factor, the way the AIDS virus can be passed on from parents to children, though not in the same genetic way. Are we to suppose that original sin is some positive disease factor, a moral disease factor, passed on by generation? And that, I think, is a misreading of the tradition. It's not exactly what Augustine says, and it's not what Aquinas says. And that's what I chiefly want to explore then in the rest of this seminar. So we turn to Aquinas, who, although he doesn't receive every bit of Augustine, including what he says about the fate of unbaptized babies, Aquinas does receive a great deal of Augustine. So on page three of the handout, we begin a lot of texts from St. Thomas. He agrees with Augustine that we depend on God's grace. But there is, in a way, a profound difference. The main reason why we depend on grace is that we are creatures called to be divine. 
Even if there had been no sin, we would have needed grace just as much as we do now. <clears throat> After sin, man needs grace for more things than before sin, but does not need it more. Adam and Eve had grace, because we are called to an eternal divine life to which human resources are not adequate. Now we need grace, not just for being raised up to the divine level, but also for the healing of our sinfulness. Sir Thomas has recourse to the concept of the supernatural, which I think was introduced into theology in a serious way by Philip the Chancellor, not long before Thomas's own time. Of course, in a way, Thomas is in line with Augustine. Augustine knows that we are called to be divine. Thomas can be more rich and precise about what divinizing grace is and how it is supernatural. Sir Thomas isn't as driven as Augustine had to be to explore our sinfulness, even if there were no sinfulness to be healed, we could know that we depend on God's grace for inheriting divine life. So it's in a way less urgent for Thomas to expand on our sinfulness, but he does accept our need for healing grace. He does, in text number 15, speak with Augustine of our nature being sick. Original sin is a sickness, a languor of nature. So does that mean that original sin is a kind of inherited disease? And the answer is not really. Health is a kind of habit, a settled disposition of our nature where everything is in harmony and sickness is a different kind of habit where everything is in disharmony. Because of the destruction of the equilibrium essential to health. So bodily sickness is partly a privation you don't have the harmony of health. In a sense, there is something positive in sickness. The parts of the soul with their own dynamics now in tension with each other. So it seems as if sickness is something with a power, but the main point about sickness is that the harmony has gone. It's not so much, especially in Thomas's time, that there is a germ there. The humours are in disorder. So in a similar kind of way, original sin is the loss of a harmony, a loss of that original justice, which leaves the faculties of our soul now in a disharmony to fight against each other so that their natural dynamics will cause conflict and tension. We'll come back to that. So original sin isn't really a positive inherited disease, but it has a certain power because of the dynamics in us whose overarching harmony has been lost. But Thomas does want to say that, in a sense, original sin is an inherited guilt. Guilt is passed on by origin from father to son. There are two words for guilt in Latin, culpa and reatus. We will see St Thomas 
qualifying the notion of culpa, a fault for which you are responsible, it is really, I think, the reatus, a liability that is passed on. And I think that's something we might question, whether the concept of reatus comes from ancient legal systems whose justice we might nowadays want to qualify. Thomas also gets from Augustine that sense that sexual intercourse, damaged by the fomes peccati, disordered desire, passes on original sin. It appears a couple of times, text 17 and 18, it's not a big part of the mechanism of St. Thomas's account of original sin. He's not really saying that sex flawed by lust causes sin, but sex does pass on our human nature to the extent that Thomas thinks that if you cloned someone, he or she would be free from original sin. <coughs> well, that's not exactly what he says, that's a modern version of it. But if God were to take, say, my little finger and miraculously grow a new human being from that little finger, that human being would be free of original sin because he wouldn't have been in Adam in a positive way, only by way of bodily substance. Nowadays, of course, we would say that if you clone someone from my little finger in some, or a cell from my little finger, that person would have my DNA and would have been in Adam in a formative way. <coughs> and I suspect that bit of St. Thomas is tied up with out-of-date biology, but also that suspicion found in some of the Church Fathers that the reason that Jesus had to be conceived of a virgin was so that he could be free of original sin. And of course that won't work nowadays, partly because Jesus did receive DNA through his mother, and partly because we now believe in the Immaculate Conception of Mary, conceived in the normal way she too is free of original sin. So there is something here which I think we don't have to receive. But it's interesting that it's found in St. Thomas. But the main picture, I think the main core element of St. Thomas's doctrine is what I've given you on page four of the handout. We inherit human nature deprived of the gifts with which it was originally endowed. That is basically that picture in Augustine that I outlined earlier, but fleshed out. So I've given you from Prima Pars question 95, article 1, Thomas's argument that the first human beings were created in grace with a supernatural gift. Because we are presented in Genesis with a picture of the first human beings with the higher powers of their soul subject to God, the lower powers subject to the higher, and the body subject to the soul. And that harmony was lost by sin, so it can't be part of human nature, because what's essential to human nature was not lost by sin. That would have been unjust. So God had given the first human beings a supernatural gift of grace, something more than human nature, partly 
to bring about that communion with God that would lead to eternal life and partly to provide all the wholeness and harmony needed within our nature. So there's that picture of an original justice, an original wholeness and integrity, which was a gift from God and was lost. And the text halfway down page four from Prima Pars question 100, article one, <coughs> says that this original justice was a property belonging to the nature of the species, not as if it sprang from some causative factor within the species, but because it was a kind of gift of God to the whole nature. <coughs> so male seamen would have passed on not the rational soul, which is given by God, but in an important sense, it would have passed on human nature. Something ready to receive that gift of God given to human nature. So the original state of the human being was with that gift of harmony, which was to be passed on not as something transmitted biologically, but as a gift that would be given on the basis of inheriting human nature. And then in the Secunda Secunde, question 164, where St. Thomas is dealing with the sin of the first parents as a sin of pride, superbia, there he speaks again of that harmony which was lost as a punishment of that fault. So, in a sense, we are all punished for the sin of Adam and Eve, not so much by the infliction of a positive punishment, but by the withdrawal of a gift that precisely as a gift was not due to us as human, but was something added to human nature. So what we have so far is that picture of an original harmony and receiving human nature by inheritance, we would have received that gift of a harmony between us and God and among ourselves and within ourselves. And as a kind of penalty for the first sin, that gift has been lost to be restored in Christ, obviously, in a way more wondrously than the first creation. So we do have to ask, in what sense can we be liable to a punishment for Adam's sin, which is perhaps the aspect of the doctrine that most offends many modern people, how could we share Adam's guilt so as to share his punishment? There's a long text on page five from Prima Secunde, question 81, Article 1. According to the Catholic faith, and he relies on some local Western councils, according to the Catholic faith, we must hold that the first sin of the first man passes on by way of origin to his descendants. Not because the rational soul is passed on with the semen, not exactly in the way that bodily defects are passed on from parent to offspring, partly because having some defect by reason of your origin seems to exclude the notion of guilt, which by definition is voluntary. <coughs> 
that's cool part. If you just inherit a defect, that's not your fault. You've not committed something wrong. But how is it that we can be liable to a punishment, a penalty, because of Adam's sin? Well, Thomas offers, halfway down that page, all human beings who are born from Adam may be considered as one man in so far as they share a nature which they receive from their first parent, rather as among citizens all the people who belong to one community are counted as one body and the whole community as one person. So there's that concept of the body politic applied now to the whole human race, a concept that was used, for example, to defend the legitimacy of capital punishment. Well into the 20th century, and I think it was only Pius XII who, after the horrors of Nazism, warned us to be very careful about seeing the state as a kind of body or organism. So Thomas wants to say that the disorder, which is in a particular human being generated from Adam, is not voluntary on account of that human being's will, but on account of the will of our first parent. It's not the sin of a given person, except in so far as this person receives nature from our first parent. So it's a funny kind of culpa, a funny kind of fault, where it's the fault of our first parent, which somehow we share. And we might be wary of that notion today and wonder whether we can hold the doctrine of original sin without so dubious a notion of collective guilt the body politic, we can certainly see how we can suffer from the sins of our leaders. The President of the USA might press the button and involve hundreds of millions of his citizens in a disastrous war, and they would suffer from it, but hardly be guilty of it. Can we hold to a shared guilt in any meaningful sense? Certainly, we do feel a shared guilt on occasion. We might, in England, feel a sense of guilt, or should it be a sense of shame for the ill treatment of Ireland or India or the slave trade and so on? So how do we refine those notions? That, I think, is the question worth pondering. But what Thomas does want to say, which I think is more attractive in a way, is, for example, at the foot of page 5, Prima Secundae 81, Article 1, Ad Secundum, the semen transmits human nature, and with that nature the infection of nature in the sense of the deprivation of health. So we receive our nature and with it well, a kind of solidarity and a kind of deprivation. At the top of page six, I have given you, well, first a remark that theologians later than St. Thomas, analysing his teaching, would distinguish the gifts that were given to human nature in our first parents, 
there are supernatural gifts strictly so called divinizing grace, faith, hope, charity, and there are preternatural gifts, that wholeness and harmony of our faculties. And the first are restored immediately when grace comes in baptism and conversion. The preternatural gifts are not restored in full, so that we may, by our contest against evil, enter more personally into Christ's own striving into his passion. But then there's an interesting text in Prima Secunde, question 82, article 3, that's text number 25, where Thomas speaks of the matter and form of original sin. Concupiscence, that disordered desire within us, that tension and warring among our faculties, is the matter of original sin, the stuff. And the form of original sin <coughs> is the loss of original justice. So Thomas identifies what you might call the mess, the disharmony within us as the stuff of original sin, but the form, the characterizing principle is the loss of original justice. <coughs> and the voluntary component, what makes it able to be called sin, is that as Thomas saw it, Adam committed a voluntary sin. Original sin is voluntary by Adam's will, not ours. So, I'm afraid, G.K. Chesterton got it wrong. Just once. <laughs> Chesterton claimed that Original sin is the one doctrine of the church that you can prove by experience. Just look around you and you can see that something has gone wrong. But in fact, you can't prove that by experience. There is a great deal of moral mess in us and around us. But that would not be characterised formed, identified as original sin unless there had been a fall from a higher state into it <coughs> by some voluntary act. <coughs> so what is revealed, what could not be proved by experience, is that the first human beings were in a higher state from which by a fault they fell. Concupiscence, disorder, is obvious. That it is an original sin is not obvious except by revelation. So let's look a little bit more closely at the disorder in us. Thomas doesn't just speak of concupiscence following Augustine's terminology, basically, he thinks that there were four wounds of sin. Not just original sin, but any sin. For the tables on page six, and it's outlined in Prima Secunde, question 85, article three. Because of original sin, and often enough because of other sins, we suffer from ignorance, malice, weakness, and concupiscence. That is to say, there isn't as much clear knowledge in our intellect as there should be. There can be an ill will in us. Those 
drives in the soul which are required for meeting challenges don't have enough oomph in them and are various desires for things like food and drink and sex all that complex of more everyday desires and drives is often at war with our reason. And it might be interesting to try to connect that notion of concupiscence with the Yetzer Hara in Jewish thought. That set of drives, which is actually basically part of our nature, not bad as such, but needs to be brought into harmony with reason. So we don't have in the fabric of our psyche all that should be there. We don't have the harmony that should be there. And that's a state into which humanity fell by a voluntary choice. That is why it can be called original sin. Something that comes to us from our origins and is in us so to speak, automatically. And Thomas gives us an interesting text on whether sin takes away what is good from human nature. That's Prima Secunda 85, 1, text number 27. There is stuff within us which is in us naturally. The principles that constitute our nature and the essential properties that flow from them, like the faculties of our soul. And that has to stay. It would be unjust for God to take that away. There is in us a natural inclination towards virtue. The drives in us, the faculties in us, their dynamics are basically good. And virtue enhances nature, vice is contrary to nature. And that good, though that goodness of our basic dynamics, remains but in a weakened state. That's important for his theory of virtue, for example. But that gift of harmony, that supernatural gift of original justice, is lost in the first sin, and of course restored by the workings of grace. <clears throat> Twice, Thomas asks whether death is natural or unnatural. Once in Primus Secundae 85.6, and again in that section in the Secunda Secundae on the sin of pride and its punishment. And both times he's very nuanced. In one sense death is natural, in one sense unnatural. The soul by nature is immortal, but the soul needs to be, so to speak, nourished by the powers of sense, by the exterior senses of touch and sight and taste and hearing, and by the interior senses like the imagination. And you can't have an armour-plated or diamond body, an incorruptible body, that is also sensitive. Because of the kind of soul, the kind of life we have, we need this kind of body with its sensitivity and therefore its vulnerability. And so death is contrary to the dynamic of the soul, but is in a way almost entailed by the kind of soul that we have. And therefore, 
we need an extra gift beyond human nature, which was given and was lost, if we are to be immortal. It's worth mentioning, in passing, but it's interesting, that in Prima Pars, question 46, article 3, Thomas says that at the very beginning of creation, in the first instant of creation, God made four things. The relatively unformed matter that is then structured in the Genesis story, so unformed matter and time, and the angels, and the Empyrean heaven. At the first moment of creation outside the <coughs> outermost kind of bit of the medieval heaven, God had made a region of light, which was already the future home of the risen body. The cosmos, as originally created, was already made to be a home for the glorified human body. So Thomas doesn't think that we would have been immortal on Earth and somehow filled up the planet with thousands of millions of people in some way or other, not specified, human beings should have transitioned from life on earth to that heavenly life, which is what we are going to do, but now we have to pass through death for it. Rather in line with that idea that the natural complexity of the human being makes death unfortunately inevitable unless we have an extra gift. So I would like to argue that concupiscence, the tension between our faculties, is also in a certain sense almost inevitable given the complexity of human nature. On the final page of the handout, page 11, I've given you a kind of diagram of the faculties, <coughs> the powers, the abilities that St. Thomas sees in the human psyche. And we needn't go through it now, but you can see that there is an incredible range of faculties in us in an organic interaction it is no wonder, given that complexity, that we need something more than the resources of human nature if it is all to work well. Rather like a photocopier needs rather more maintenance than a pair of pliers. And it can go wrong in much more irritating ways. <laughs> it is part of our dignity Thomas says it's part of our dignity that we need more than human nature if we are to achieve our fulfilment, which is in God. And you could analogously say the very complexity of our human nature is a sign of dignity and at the same time a cause of need. That text I mentioned is in Prima Secundae, question 5, article 5, ad secundum. <coughs> but at the top of page 9, I've given you another reference. Thomas thinks, and this is quest Prima Pars, question 101, Thomas thinks that if there had been no sin, children would still have been born, needing to grow towards the use of reason. Children would not have had the use of reason at birth because the brain would have been too wet. That's his medieval diagnosis for why children can't think rationally. Um, but there would have been that developmental process 
there would have been the Passiones anime, the various drives from birth, <coughs> but not the use of reason. The Yetzer Hara, to speak in Jewish terminology, would still have had 13 years head start on the Yetzer Hatov, unless there had been something given to human nature to work a harmony and a wholeness and an integrity that would not be natural. So it seems to me that Thomas's picture <coughs> is basically one that human nature was endowed with more than natural gifts in its first parents, and those gifts were lost in the fall and are restored in the right order in Christ. And that means it's not so much a positive disease factor, an inherited flaw, as the fact that we don't inherit the grace that was lost. But Thomas does, to some extent, defend the justice of that as a kind of penalty with the concept <coughs> of a kind of inherited guilt, because we are one person in Adam. It's worth mentioning in just a couple of minutes, because time is running out, development since St. Thomas's time. The Council of Trent, of course, gives us very early on in session five, a very brief decree on original sin, passed on by propagation, not imitation, presenting it again as the loss of grace and justice, but then something less well known by people who look at the history of this doctrine. In 1567, Pope Pius V issued a bull Ex omnibus afflictionibus, in which he condemned certain propositions of the Louvain theologian Michel de Bay, who accepted the condemnation of his ideas. And some are relevant to our issue. Pius V condemned the idea that infants are born with a habitual will against God. The human will is not positively set against God at our individual origins. It's rather more like the will comes into existence as a kind of blank slate on which God has not yet been written and the effect of baptism and conversion is to right God on our will. That rather goes with St. Thomas's account of limbo <coughs> for unbaptized babies as a department of heaven rather than a department of hell in the Augustinian way. But Pius also condemned the proposition that God could not have created man from the beginning in the state in which he is now born. You can't prove that something went wrong by looking at human beings as we are now. It is not certain that we fell into this state. This state could be a natural state, not having the gifts it needs, but we can't say without revelation that we lost gifts that we originally had. And then finally, among the great range of 20th century theology on this subject, it's worth mentioning Karl Rahner. One of his papers explores rather interestingly that notion of concupiscentia, that tension between our faculties, and he points out that it is not simply a case that 
the emotion, so to speak, resist reason, and that's a bad thing, sometimes the lack of fit between emotions and reason can be a good thing. You might deliberately decide to tell a lie, and then when you try to do so, you blush, and your instinctive emotions are saving you from being wholehearted in your deliberate lie. We shouldn't identify sinfulness with just the more animal component of us. There can be purely intellectual and voluntary malicious sins from which our more animal component can save us. More importantly for our purposes, in his penultimate article on original sin, in volume 11 of the Theological Investigations, Rana tries to express the core of the doctrine of original sin by saying that as human nature was set up, our derivation from and our union with the single human race was meant to be the medium and the basis of God's self-gift, of grace. So by inheriting human nature from our first parents, that was meant to be the basis and the medium of receiving grace. That is basically the picture that I have found in Thomas, and human nature was rendered unfit for that purpose by the first sin. So rather than speaking of a universal collective guilt of any kind, Rana points out that human nature, as a biological, psychological, social reality, can be damaged by sin, and the first sin, among the first couple or in the first group, whichever you go to, would have damaged nature and made it unfit for its purpose as being a basis for grace. And so grace must come to us not on the basis of our inheritance, but through restoration in Christ. And it seems to me that that might be a useful way of sidelining that notion of a collective guilt and finding a more attractive way in which we can say that original sin in us is not an arbitrary punishment of God, but is in fact almost naturally entailed by the first sin. So I offer you that idea that the core of Thomas's doctrine <coughs> is that human nature was endowed with gifts which were lost and not passed on by the passing on of human nature, and raise the question whether something like Rana's re-expression <coughs> might be a good way of basing and capturing that. I'm not advertising his last article where he denies that there was in fact any fall, because I think that is not consonant with the Catholic faith. So that's in